Okay, well, it looks like it's time, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Patrick. I'm a software engineer at VMware, and today I'm going to be introducing you to Apache Geode uh, by way of Spring. So first, let's start with the basics. What is Apache Geode? So Geode is a distributed in-memory data management system. Distributed in the sense that Geode is comprised of multiple data servers that will to get work together to make up a cluster, uh, you can partition your data across the servers so that your data set is split up across them, or you could replicate your data and have multiple redundant sets um, on multiple servers, or you could configure for both. Um, and it's in memory, so unlike a traditional um, relational like SQL database that's going to store things mostly on disk, uh, Geode primarily is going to be storing things in memory, um, mostly for speed sake. Um, though it can also be configured to store things on disk if you need your data to be a little more permanent. Uh, Geode is also an object database. So again, unlike a traditional relational database that stores data as a row in a table, uh, Geode stores your data in object form in what we call a region. Uh, so a region is just a key value store that's got some object type as your key and some object type as your value. Um, and you can have multiple regions, the same way a traditional database can have uh, multiple tables. So really, Geode is a bunch of maps, because a region is just a key value store. So Geode is a bunch of distributed in-memory maps. Obviously, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's it's kind of the core if you really want to think about it that way. OK, so why would you want to use Geode? Uh, as I said before, everything's stored in memory. Uh, which is great for speed. So performance intensive uh, use cases, Geode's a great fit for. It makes a great cache for speeding up your website or web service or whatever it is. That's one really common use case. Uh, scalability, you can always just spin up more servers as you need more memory, more disk space, more computing resources, and you can scale out. Um, Geode clusters are capable of handling terabyte scale data and many thousands of operations per second. So whatever workload you've got, Geode can handle that. Uh, Geode also provides strong consistency guarantees and database-like transactionality, which can be really critical for, um, for applications where you have to be consistent all the time. Maybe if you're working with financial data where you're not allowed to just lose money um, or something like that. And then there are a whole bunch of other really useful, very powerful features to Geode some of which I'm going to get to talking about here in a few minutes, the majority of which I'm unfortunately not going to be able to fit into this presentation. <clears throat> okay, so we've talked about what Geode is, but that's only half the title of this talk. So what is Spring? So Spring is a Java application framework that was originally created to make uh, enterprise Java development better. It allowed you to deploy your app as a jar instead of a war file. Um, and allows you to uh, run your application without an application server. Also provides a whole bunch of other useful utilities to make developing applications better and easier. It's also an inversion of control container. So one big uh, feature of Spring is dependency injection, which is great for making your code more modular, less tightly coupled, more easily testable, all very good things. Um, but more than just a framework, Spring is really an ecosystem of a bunch of related projects and related frameworks that kind of build off this core to provide a whole bunch of different um, different usefulness for different applications. <clears throat> so we've talked about Geode and we've talked about Spring. What do these two things have to do with each other? <clears throat> so that ecosystem I talked about on the last slide, at the core or the base, however you want to picture the topology of that, we have the Spring framework. And then off of that, we have a bunch of different sub projects. Um, in this case, we're going to be talking about two specifically, Spring Data and Spring Boot. So Spring Data makes it easier to work with different data stores, provides an abstraction on top of them so that you can interact with any of your data stores, whether it's a SQL database or Geode or some other NoSQL store. You can interact with all of them in the same consistent way. So you can switch out data stores without having to rewrite your whole app, and you don't have to get into like all the nitty gritty details of any specific store. 
Spring Boot is a really powerful project. Uh, it adds auto configuration on top of the Spring framework. What auto configuration does is it, it'll automatically uh, kind of like set defaults for you. It'll take um, whatever configuration properties, pick a sensible default that'll work for the majority case um, and just run with that. So you don't have to explicitly set that. Um, so it'll allow you to write even less code than you would just using the Spring framework. Um, now, obviously, if you're in the minority case there and you you don't want those default values, you can override that auto configuration by just providing the explicit configuration, just like you would with any other application. Um, but if it's not something you care about or if you are in that majority, you don't have to worry about it, which is great. <clears throat> so under Spring Data, we have Spring Data Geode. This is where the connection comes in. So Spring Data Geode just provides Spring Data support for Geode. Um, allows you to interact with Geode in that consistent abstracted way, like I mentioned before, um, and allows you to configure Geode using um, Spring's, um, Spring's annotations. So that, that's how you configure Spring applications for the most part, is via Java annotations that I will show you later. And now we're going to take it one step further with Spring Boot Data Geode. This adds Spring Boot's auto configuration on top of Spring Data Geode, which makes it even quicker and even easier um, to get off started writing Geode apps, um, which is great. So this is the project that I'm going to be using for the rest of this talk. This is what I'm going to be talking about. So let's move on. So now you might be thinking, why Spring? Like, why does this project exist? Spring Boot Data Geode. Why is that a thing? Why does Geode want to be supported by Spring? Why would you want to use Spring um, in getting started with Geode? <clears throat> so there are a few reasons. The first, um, the simplest reason really, is that it, it just makes developing Geode applications easier. It allows you to write less code, configure less of the details on your own, get up and running quicker without having to worry about um, so many little things. Um, and it's just a little less verbose than Geode's native API. And then of course it's portable. If you ever needed to switch to some different store or something like that, um, you don't have to re-architect everything because you've got those spring data abstractions. So it's just a great way to architect your, your app in the first place. Um, now this is really a reason of why Geode would want to support the spring, um, this project, is spring has a really large user base. Um, some estimates would say something like 60% of Java developers use Spring. So obviously that's a lot of people and those people are going to want any data store they use um, to, to support the Spring data abstractions and to work in this Spring environment the way they'd expect. So obviously for that user base, we want that to work for them. And then this is really key. Building your Geode application using Spring Boot Data Geode or Spring Data Geode or any of those Spring projects is going to enable a lot of the power of the broader Spring ecosystem because there's a lot more to it than just Spring Data and Spring Boot. Um, there are projects that provide support for developing web applications, tooling for microservices, reactive programming, security, just to name a few. There's a whole bunch of power of the system um, that you'll be able to just pull in at your fingertips, um, no problem. So let's get started writing a basic Geode app using Spring. <clears throat> so first things first, we're going to need to pull in the dependency. So this is my Maven POM file. Um, you could use Gradle, in which case this would be your build.gradle, but I'm using Maven. So down here in the dependencies section, uh, I've got this Spring Geode starter. So that's the dependency you're going to want to pull in if you're trying to, trying to do this at home. <clears throat> to get, that's, this is the dependency that's going to get you Spring Boot Data Geode. Pardon me, just a second. Okay, so we've got that. Now we're going to write our Geode application. First things first, we're going to need something to store in Geode. We're going to need some kind of entity class um, to create instances of and store in Geode. So I've created this attendees class, uh, an attendee representing someone who's attending this conference. So as you can see, it's a pretty simple data class. It's got three fields and an all args constructor. It's just got an ID, first name, last name, and an overridden two string just to make it prettier to print out. But one thing you might notice is this at region annotation on the top. So all the, so this, uh, this annotation, this is how Spring is primarily configured via annotations like this. Um, and this is just telling Spring that this attendees class is going to map to um, the attendees region. 
and I'll get I'll talk uh, more about that in a minute. Okay, so now we've got a domain class. We need a way to interact with Geo to be able to store and retrieve uh, instances of that that class. So we're going to create what's called a repository. Now this is uh, a Spring Data abstraction that Spring Data supports repositories like this for a whole bunch of different data stores. Um, so we're going to create an interface. I'm going to call it attendees repository, and we're going to extend CRUD repository, um, which is a Spring class. And we're going to parameterize it with attendee and long. So attendee is going to be our value type in our region, and long is going to be our key type. Um, and that's all we have to do here. We don't have to implement this interface. We don't have to add any methods to it. Just by virtue of extending that CRUD repository, we're going to get a bunch of basic um, data access operations to be able to put and get data out of geode. So let's put this to work. So this is our main application class here. Up at the top, you're going to see more annotations. Again, this is how this is how Spring is configured. So this is this is the bulk of our configuration in this application. So at Spring Boot application at the top, that's not specific to Geode. That's just Spring Boot, just telling it this is going to be a Spring Boot application, enable auto configuration, enable all that other Spring Boot power. Um, at entity defined regions is the next one. That's really powerful. So that's going to go look at our entity class and look at that at region annotation um, that I showed you before. And it's going to say, oh, we're going to need a region called attendees for this attendee class. So I'll go automatically create that. Now, we don't have to configure that. It's just done for us, which is great. This next annotation, enable cluster configuration. Again, very powerful. So this is going to allow our client to push its configuration up to the geode cluster. Um, so that region that's automatically being created for us um, is then going to also be created on the server side. So we don't have to configure it on the client. We don't have to configure it on the server. Spring's just going to look at our attendee class and set all of that up for us. <clears throat> Down here, like all Java applications, we've got a main. Now, our main is very simple. Spring application dot run. And then we're handing it our application class. So this is just going to start a Spring application and tell it that this class is where it can find its configuration to go set itself up. Pretty simple. Down here, is where it gets interesting. We've got this application runner, and we've got it annotated with at bean. So what at bean does is it's going to register it in the Spring context um, so that when the Spring application starts up, it's going to create all of these beans, anything annotated with at bean. Um, and in this case, when we call that Spring application dot run, it's going to go look for anything of type runner, of application runner. There's some other kinds of runners. It's going to go look for all of those create them, and then run them. So anything we put in this Lambda here, um, that's what's going to happen. So this basically becomes our new main. Now, if you look here at the arguments list for our runner, we've got that attendees repository that created before. We don't have to pass this in anywhere. This is Spring's dependency injection that I talked about a few slides back. Um, when Spring creates this application runner, it's going to inject that repository in here. So we don't have to create this explicitly. We don't have to pass it in. We don't have to create the repository. That's all just taken care of for us and, and wired in so we can use it. So let's get to the business logic. So in here, we're just very simple. We're going to create an attendee, calling him Jack Black, giving him an ID of one. Uh, I imagine Jack Black, unfortunately, is probably not attending this talk, um, but that would be cool. And down here, we're going to use that repository that we're dependency injecting in, and we're going to save Mr. Jack Black uh, to Geode. And then we're going to do repository.findbyid, passing in the ID that we created him with, and it's going to go find him and return him to us. Um, so that's that's all the code for this basic application. So let's let's run this. But before we can run it, we're going to need to start a Geode cluster. And there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, the first way I'm going to show you to do that is through this tool called Gfish, which is a cool shell utility for starting, stopping, and managing uh, your geode clusters. So the first command we're going to um, we're going to issue once we've got this opened up, uh, Gfish will come with your installation of geode, by the way. Um, so once we've got this opened up, we're going to do start locator. So a locator is another kind of member, like a server, uh, but it doesn't store data. It's mostly there for like uh, service discovery so that Client connecting can connect to the correct server, um, maybe the server that has specifically the piece of data that it's wanting. Um, for our case, 
because what we're doing is so simple. We don't technically need a locator, um, but I'm going to start one anyway. And then after that starts up, we're going to do start server. This server is where our data is going to actually live. This is going to host our attendees region. Uh, the other way to start a Geode server is through Spring. So just like we had a Spring Boot application uh, to be our Geode client, we can also have one to be a Geode server. So this is going to look very similar from before, except a lot shorter. We've got the Spring Boot uh, application annotation on top. Our main looks virtually identical to the client. The difference is this annotation at cache server application, which is just going to tell Spring that this that this app is supposed to be a server. So it'll create that accordingly. So then once you've got either that started up or you've started it through Gfish, whichever, you've got your cluster up and running. Let's oops, let's run the application. It's not auto playing for me. OK, so it's starting up. We're saving Jack Black with ID 1. And we've retrieved Jack Black for ID 1. Looks like the same guy. So there it is. Very little code. And we've done very basic put and get. But you're probably going to want more advanced um, ways to access data than just put for ID, get for ID. So uh, you can actually do a lot more with that repository than what we did. So you can add uh, you can add more methods like this. We've got find all by last name. It's going to return a list of attendee and it's going to take a string representing the last name. Now, notice there's still no body to this. So by following this naming convention, find okay, that's going to go get it's going to go get our data. All that's telling it that we want all of them. We want a list rather than just one by last name. That's telling it a field that we want to match. This naming convention is essentially uh, kind of like a query language. So if we name our methods accordingly, Spring will just figure out what we want, and it's going to implement that for us, um, which is really awesome, really powerful. And you can do more complicated things than just matching a single field. Like down here, find all by first name starts with, and then we pass in a substring that'll be the start of the first name, and it'll return all attendees whose first name field starts with this substring. Um, this is very powerful because you can get a whole bunch of pretty advanced data access without having to write really any code. Um, and this, this can do a whole bunch of things, more than I'm showcasing here. But let's say you get into a scenario where you can't represent what you, what you want, the kind of query you want in this language. So you can actually supply a custom query like I'm doing down here. I've got this find all by ID not using query. Um, and then it takes an ID and returns a list of attendees. So it's going to find everything, uh, all attendees that don't have that ID that we're passing in. Now, if I took off that using query, uh, Spring would actually know what this means and be able to interpret that. Um, so I'm just messing up that naming convention for demonstration sake so I can provide my own query. So the way we do that is through that at query annotation that you see up top there. Select star from attendees A, where A.ID doesn't equal dollar sign one. So dollar sign one is just referring to that ID that we're passing in. If we were passing in multiple parameters, we could have dollar sign one, dollar sign two, dollar sign three to refer to the, the other parameters um, as you go along. But we've just got one. Um, so yeah, that, that's it. You provide that query. And then when that method's called, it's going to issue that query against Geode. So this query looks like SQL, but it's not. Uh, it's OQL, object query language, which is what Geode uses for queries. It is very similar to SQL, but it is not SQL. So just be aware of that. So now that we've added these new methods to our repository, let's make use of them. So this is our, our, uh, excuse me, our updated application runner. Uh, so now we are creating three different attendees. We're creating still Jack Black, Emily Black, and Janet Lee and we're saving all of them to the repository. Then down here, we're going to do find all by last name black. So we would be expecting this to return us Jack Black and Emily Black. Then find all uh, by first name starts with J. So we'd be expecting Jack Black and Janet Lee. And then down here, we're doing find all by ID not using query, passing in one, which is Jack Black's ID. So we would be expecting it to find Emily Black and Janet Lee. So let's give this a shot.
starting up and <clears throat> there we've got it for last name black we've got emily black and jack black uh for all attendees with the first name starting with j janet lee and jack black and then for all attendees that don't have the id one we've got emily black and janet lee just like we'd expect so awesome right there wrote basically no code got those new data access methods super cool um but so far all that i've showed you is repository stuff which is actually spring data features it's not geode specific so let's go talk about some more geode specific features so what i'm going to talk about first i'm going to talk about continuous queries it's like a query but instead of just being fired once and returning a result set it's going to constantly update so every time something changes on the region um, that would change the results of that query, it's going to go send over the new results. So to do this, we're going to start by adding a new annotation, client cache application, and then set subscription enabled equal to true. Subscription enabled is just a property that we can set within this annotation for configuration sake. Um, so this annotation, the client cache application, is something that was previously being automatically configured for us um, by Spring Boot. However, that subscription enabled uh, defaults to being false. And we want it to be true in this case, because we need to like subscribe our query to the server. Um, so we're going to override that auto configuration by supplying that annotation specifically and setting the property as we want it. Now down here, we actually create our continuous query on this method that we've annotated with at continuous query. We give it a name and we give it a query very simple query just select star from attendees so it's going to go get everything in the region so then anytime anything new is added to that region we're going to get that new updated value um, and this method is going to be called <laughs> so in this method very simple we're just we're getting the cq event which is going to contain a bunch of information the new value a bunch of other stuff we're just using it for the new value and we're just going to print out that new value saying that we found it so up here in our runner we're now going to be creating six attendees um, in a list, and then we're going to iterate over that list and uh, save them one by one with a two second delay between each. So we should be able to see the application uh, insert a new attendee and then see our continuous query update getting that new value. Now, normally you might want to do this in separate applications because it's, it's not terribly useful to be putting data into a into a region just to be getting it from a continuous query, you could just call that method yourself when you're when you're inserting this value. Uh, you might want a separate application to be getting updates when some other applications update the region. But in this case, just for demonstration sake, it's easier to just show a single application running and we should see the inner leaving of the attendee being added to the region and our CQ firing. So that's all we need to change to get this running. <clears throat> so let's run it. And there it is, we've saved Jack Black and it found Jack Black. We've saved Emily Black and it found Emily Black. And you can see it doing that for all the rest of them. It's updated after every time, which is exactly what we would expect. Awesome. The next feature we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about functions. So this is a really cool thing that Geode provides. Geode lets you register a custom function on the server side so that you can process data where the data lives. Uh, you don't have to go send all of your data across the wire just to process it to get like an integer value out of it or something. Because if you have a large data set, that can be very expensive to have to go retrieve, you know, terabytes of data just to process it. So if you can go process it where your data lives, awesome. Now, if you've started your server in the spring way that I showed you before, it's really, really easy to register a function with just a couple of annotations. If you didn't and you started your cluster with GFish, you can still totally use this function feature. You're just gonna build your function into a jar and deploy it using a GFish command. Still very simple, but I'm gonna show you the spring way to do this. So in that server application that we wrote earlier, we're gonna start by adding a new annotation, enable Gemfire functions. So Gemfire is just another name for Geode. It's the name that Geode was under before it was open sourced and it's the name of a commercial offering, but for this purpose, you can just pretend that that says geode. And then it's pretty self-explanatory. It's just enabling geode functions. It's gonna enable us to go 
and register functions on the server. Then down here, this is where we're actually creating the function. We're giving it an ID, calculate average first name length, which is just the same as the name of the, the function. This ID is just so that we have a way to refer to it on the client side, so we can call this function specifically. Um, and then we're setting the has result property to true. It defaults to false because you can have void methods. You could just do some kind of mass update across your data. You don't need to return a result. But in this case, we are going to return a result. We're going to return the average number of characters in uh, all of our attendees' first names. So in this function here, we would just uh, put all of the logic for that and just return a result just like a normal function. If you look at the arguments list of that function, we've got this region data map. Um, and it's annotated with at region data. So this is going to represent the contents of that region because a region is a key value store, much like a map. So this is how we're going to interact with those values to be able to process them in our function. And the at region data annotation just tells Spring that this data is something that isn't going to be explicitly passed in, but something that's just going to be pulled from um, that's just going to be pulled from our region, so we can use it. If you wanted to add more. Um, if you wanted to add more parameters here, you would just add them to the list and not annotate them with that region data. Or if you didn't need the region data, you would just omit that and add whatever parameters you need. So that's it for the server side. It's just that simple, just writing the function and adding those two annotations. So now we need to, to uh, call this on the client side. So we're going to create an interface. Uh, we're going to call it attendee function executions, plural executions, because we could have multiple functions in this, but we just have one right now. So we're going to annotate it with on region and tell attendees that just tells Spring what region this function is going to operate on. <clears throat> and then down here, we define the interface for the function, just giving it the return value, the name, the arguments list, excluding the region data field. Um, so in this case, no arguments. And then annotating it with at function ID and giving it that same ID on the server uh, that we had on the server so it knows how to how to map those. It knows what to invoke. And this is all we have to do here. Back in our application runner class, uh, we've got the attendee function executions now being uh, now being dependency injected in just like our attendees repository. We don't have to implement it. We don't have to create it. We don't have to pass it in anywhere. Spring just finds it, wires it in where it needs to be so we can use it. So what we're doing now in this in this runner, we're still creating those same six attendees, uh, but instead of adding them one by one in a loop, we're just adding them all at once, and then we're going to call the function. So down here, function executions dot calculate average first name. That's going to go get the value, or that's going to go execute the function on the server, return the value back to us. So let's go take a look. It's running, average first name length five. Bam, there it is, correct. OK, so it's pretty cool. I've shown you some cool features of Geode, by no means all of them. Um, and I, I hope you see how easy it is to, to actually do some of these things, how little code we've written. But so far, all we've written are command line applications, which in the real world is almost certainly not what you're going to be doing. You're going to be writing maybe a web application. So maybe you wanted to expose this function through a REST API. So because we are in the Spring ecosystem, we can do that really easily. We can just pull in Spring's web, Spring's web framework and get a REST API set up really quick. So first things first, in our, um, in our pom.xml or build.gradle, we're going to add a new dependency, Spring Boot Starter Web. Um, that's all we're going to need, and we can get started building our REST API. So we're going to create a new class, calling it attendees controller. And we're going to annotate it with at REST controller, just telling Spring that this is going to be our REST API so it can create it for us and start this REST API uh, started listening on port 8080 by default um, if we don't change it. And down here, we've got a constructor. This constructor takes the attendee function execution and just stores that in a field. Um, this isn't anything we have to call. We don't have to create an instance of this class. Spring is going to use this constructor to dependency inject that function execution, um, just like it did into our runner. And then we can use it. And here, we've got our endpoint mapping annotated with at get mapping. Uh, there's also put mapping, post mapping, um, all those verbs. Um, but this is going to be get because we're just going to be returning the value from that function. 
and then you give it that slash average name length to tell it where to find this endpoint. That's going to be like the part of the URL that it's going to go to. And then whenever that endpoint's hit, it's just going to call this function where we just call our remote function and it's going to return the value. We don't have to do anything else. We don't have to mess with like HTML or anything. Just a normal function that returns a float. Spring will take care of the rest and return it for us. So that's all there is to write here. So let's go ahead and uh, start this up. And then in Postman, we're going to try to hit that endpoint. And there it is at localhost 8080, average name length. We hit that endpoint and we got five, which as before is the correct value. That's exactly what we're expecting. So that's all I have to show you today. Um, I'd like, I hope that you've taken away just how, how easy it is to start with Geode, how easy Spring makes that, and how easy it is to integrate the other powerful parts of the Spring ecosystem with your app once you've started writing it this way. Um, so if you're interested in Geode or in Spring or any of this stuff, here's some other resources you can check out. Geode.apache.org, that's the homepage for Apache Geode. Spring.io is the home of all the Spring stuff. Um, under that, you can find information on the Spring Framework, Spring Data, Spring Boot, Spring Boot Data Geode, any of these other projects. Or this last link at the bottom, uh, all of the demo code that I used in these slides is going to be available on my GitHub if you want to check that out. So that concludes my talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions? <clears throat> How do you do geode transactions? Uh, so within Spring, there's a uh, at transaction annotation. So if you have some method that you need to be transactional, you can just annotate that with at transaction. Um, there's also another annotation that you're going to need to, uh, I think it's something like at enable Gemfire transactions or at enable transactions. Um, and then you can just run that method like anything else, um, and it'll be transactional automatically dealing with the commit and and or rollback for you. Is it recommended running Geode Server as Spring Boot app now? Uh, so it's not something we recommend, but it's not something we recommend against. Um, it's not something very common that we see in production. For the most part, people just start their servers the normal Geode way. Um, primarily, I personally have used um, the Spring Boot application method for like for testing because you can just spin up a server process really easily. You can see what's happening on the server. You can register your functions really easily like that. Um, but for the most part in production, you'd probably just want to start things through GFish. But that totally depends on your use case. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you. Okay, well, uh, hope you guys enjoyed the talk. Hope someone's interested in Geode and or Spring. Uh, I guess if there's no more questions, then that's it. Okay, uh, bye everybody.